Our speaker today is Professor Hao Chung from uh, University of Texas, Austin. She's going to talk about machine learning for file system operation. Uh, before I start introducing her, uh, let me remind you there is a special seminar next Tuesday. Time is 10 o'clock, 10 to 11 p.m. Uh, so if you can make it, I'll recommend you to uh, attend. Uh, our last seminar for this quarter is next Thursday, same time. Uh, the speaker is from the city of Palo Alto Utilities. And, and um, remember, uh, next week we'll go back to our usual room. Y2E2, 360. Our speaker today is uh, Professor Hao Chu, and she is currently a, an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at the, the University of Texas at Austin. She received her bachelor's degrees from Tsinghua University, her master's and PhD degrees from the University of Minnesota, all in electrical engineering. Uh, she was a postdoctoral research associate and later became an associate assistant professor at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on developing uh, algorithms for learning and optimization forms in energy systems. Her current research interests include physics-aware and risk-aware machine learning for power system operations and the design of energy management systems. Uh, she is the recipient of NSF Career Award, and, and she is also also the, the faculty advisor for three best student papers at the North American House in Posey. She's a member of the IEEE PS Non-Range Planning Committee and an associate editor for the IEEE Transactions on Smart Grid. Okay, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chen Wu, for inviting me and also in the introduction. Um, so, um, yeah, I came to Stanford, I think, five years ago when I was in uh, Illinois. And uh, it's great to be back, uh, uh, unfortunately, virtually. But uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, we will get a chance to have a um, um, in-person visit sometime. So. Yeah, so um, today I'm going to um, talk more on problems in power systems operations and particularly how to design machine learning tools that are physics aware and uh, risk aware. So I'd like to uh, thank my grad students and also National Science Foundation for the funding support. Uh, yeah, maybe I should go full screen. Yeah. Uh, is this uh, working well? Okay, um, so we have seen that uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technology has uh, propelled the development of data analytics in the energy world. And it has been identified to uh, tackle several challenge problems in energy systems related to disaster resiliency. You know, like some kind of anomaly detection and um, um, basically the operation of the grid as well. So this is uh, uh, thanks to the proliferation uh, of various type of data that we have today in the energy systems or the electric power grid in particular. Um, but the question still remains that uh, although the AI and the machine learning ML tools are very powerful, um, there are still uh, some gap between the problem specific challenges if we want to apply them to real time power system operations. So I'd like to uh, show like three problems that we are currently working on now that how to incorporate domain knowledge from power systems to better design the machine learning or the neural network tools, basically. So the first one is related to the market prediction. And a lot of interest have been devoted to this problem, but then there's an issue of uh, dimensionality or like this, uh, the uh, complexity issue. As we know that a large scale power system has thousands, if not more, uh, uh, many number of nodes. 
So the idea we're uh, going to uh, uh, look at is how to incorporate the topology information of the grid to simplify the model of neural network. And the second one is related to the coordination at the grid edge, or what traditionally we call distribution systems, that we have seen more and more distributed solar, distributed storage, and all these collectively called distributed energy resources that need to be coordinated in a, a synchronous fashion to support, uh, uh, to support the operating condition of the connected distribution system. And when we apply machine learning tools to this problem, there is a concern that the, when the machine learning models are applied on the field, they can cause some uh, adversary uh, operating condition and due to the risk uh, of these tools. And then we will see how to uh, try to reduce the risk uh, associated with this uh, decentralized machine learning models. Uh, last but not least, I'm uh, just going to quickly show some uh, recent results that we have related to using the same ideas of scalable learning or decentralized learning, but for more like emergency operations during like extreme weather events, when there are multiple failures, how can we use machine learning to quickly restore the operation to normal condition? So I will focus on the first two problems, and then um, uh, the last one will be uh, very uh, nicely connected uh, to the first two as a, a small extension of our current work. So the first one is on real-time market operation. Um, the specific uh, optimization problem for market operation is called optimal power flow. So um, Currently, it's solved as an optimization problem using numeric solvers. And you can think of that input is the grid condition, the, uh, the de power demand, the topology of the system, and then also other parameters. And the solution or the output here is what uh, the dispatchable resource set point or some other uh, type of uh, uh, actions that we can make to or controllable actions to the great resources. So there exists a multitude of optimization solvers or OPF solvers that you can use. And the issue, one of the issues is that it can um, uh, get stuck because it's a non-convex problem, or there could be a numeric and also computational concerns. But then in the daily operation, basically we fit in like multiple instances of input in the real-time OPF solution. What is the current situation of the grid on the input side? And then it will get us a, a set of output in order to send to the generators or the resources for dispatch. So the idea comes here is that since we have all these instance and, uh, instances of input and output, can we train a neural network model to predict what's going to be the uh, idea set point of generators or set point of some resources based on specific input? So this uh, a neural network model can simplify the online real-time computation burden of the OPF solution because the feedforward uh, 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 computation is very fast. So this is the basic idea of using neural network for OPF. And as I mentioned, it's a quickly a growing area and there are a lot of works looking at the DC, which is the linearized version or like the AC, the original nonlinear power flow problem. And people have sort of using it as like um, the OPF solution, oh, sorry, the neural network solution as a warm start uh, so that the AC OPF can converge faster. There are also other uh, versions of stochastic OPF and also like uh, directly uh, connected to the uh, duality an uh, analysis. So our objective here is trying to explore the grid topologies because in all of these neural networks, they're generally black box model. They don't consider uh, or contain any kind of information about the grid uh, topology or the grid uh, parameter settings. So our idea here is that by exploiting the topology, we can potentially reduce the complexity of these uh, trend neural network models significantly. Okay, so I'll just uh, be brief here on this formulation of OPF. So thinking about the, the network model as a graph with n number of nodes here. So the AC OPF, the original nonlinear power flow, 
problem, uh, OK power flow problem aims to determine the real power P and reactive power Q uh, injections at every node in order to minimize the total cost of supplying that P, uh, P solution, like the real power uh, supply cost. So there are a bunch of uh, conditions we need to uh, uh, satisfy. The first one is power flow balance. So, and this is according to kickoff law. And the second one is the voltage operating limits because we want the voltage to stay close to the rated uh, voltage level. The third and fourth, uh, the limits uh, based on the type of generation plants we have, what are the, the corresponding limits at every node for the PQ injection. Uh, last but not least, we also need to satisfy the network uh, line flow limits. So the FIJ is the amount of power flow on each uh, transmission line uh, between bus I and bus J, and their associated thermal limits uh, for each line uh, as well. So in this sense, uh, at every node, there are inputs that we can stack in into this vector xi, which includes the, uh, gener uh, the PQ limits and also some coefficients for this objective function on the generation cost. Usually it's a piecewise linear or quadratic function depending on the type of generation we have. And this is the number of uh, input at every node. So we have n number of these xi's. So if we want to uh, do the regular OPF, we will try to predict what is the optimal P and I here. So at every node, we also have the output of optimal P and Q, which means that the number of output also scales linearly with the number of nodes N. So if we have N inputs and N outputs, if we uh, train it using a, a typical fully connected neural network or FCNN, we know that in each layer, we would expect the number of parameters scale with the product of the number of input and output, which essentially is in the order of N squared. And for a larger system, this is a lot of uh, 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 a lot of parameters that we need to train. And uh, we know that uh, the more complicated a neural network is, the more easy we can have issues of stuck in um, like a suboptimal solutions and also the training time uh, computational issue. So, um, so the idea is to say that okay, can we incorporate the topology knowledge? to simplify the neural network. And as we will see very soon, um, the uh, topology type of embedded neural network is called graph neural network or GNN. So people have explored to use the GNN architecture to predict P and Q. However, a missing gap here is that to uh, for the GNN network to be very powerful, there needs to be a, some kind of locality property, which means that the predicted value should be very close if they're um, in a uh, neighborhood region. Okay, so like say this is the network here, so the P and Q at node 10 should be very close to the P and Q on node uh, 8. Based, so that's essentially the locality property. This is not the case for the generation output because the generation output depends on its own cost. So, it, so if a generator at node 10 is producing at its higher limit, it doesn't mean that we should also try to utilize, fully utilize generator at node eight. So there is a, a large gap of using GNN to predict P and Q. Here comes our, our idea. We realize that it, although PQ does not satisfy this locality property, the uh, locational marginal price, which is the output from the OPF problem, specifically from the dualized OPF problem, satisfy this locality property. And what is LMP? So let's consider a simpler version of the OPF where we only have power balance and also this land flow limits here. And it's only related to the real power input P. So this is a simple um, linear constraints here, and we uh, we can introduce multipliers, like larger multipliers for this constraint, and then the last constraint. 
the location of the marginal price is essentially the linear combination of all these optimal multipliers, which help us to determine what should be the specific PI set point based on this pi i at the node i. Okay, um, so this pi vector is related to the multipliers associated with the land limits uh, according to this matrix S transpose. And the matrix S is fully dependent on the graph topology. Specifically, it shares the same aging space as the graph Laplacian uh, B here, which empowers a system we call the B bus admittance bus matrix, which uh, uh, it is a weighted uh, graph Laplacian, but then it is a uh, uh, topology dependent uh, quantity. So because uh, in real-time operations, there are very few uh, congested lines, which means that this multiplier mu difference is mostly sparse. It's only non-zero at the congested lines. And therefore, um, the LMP pi here is uh, depending on this congested lines fully based on the topology of the graph Laplacian. And that is why it satisfies nicely this locality property that we are looking for uh, when we apply a uh, graph neural network. So just to show you some uh, real world uh, price map, this is the, uh, the uh, Texas ERCOD uh, LMP, real-time uh, LMP value. And uh, so it's a contour plot. You can see that around this uh, uh, east area, which are usually the low centers, Dallas, Austin, Houston, the price is much higher than like the producer or like a more remote area of West Texas. And, uh, and when this uh, price definitely shows this locality property because it's very uh, con uh, concentrated based on the geographic area. Similarly, this is uh, uh, the California ISO LMP, where you also see this locality when the price, which can go uh, as high as $150, uh, $150 uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the Bay Area, I believe here, and well, for the rest of uh, California, the price is uh, much lower, around $50 uh, per hour, I believe. So. Basically, uh, the LMP allows us to explore the GNN or the graph neural network uh, uh, model to do the prediction. So very quickly on what GNN is, um, essentially when we look at the input, which is that every node has this XI. So I have N of this XI here. And every layer of GNN considers, uh, includes two filter, a W here, which is based on the topology. So um, this um, WIJ entry is, non-zero whenever there is a connected line, okay? And then the other part of the filter is the H. This is like a typical uh, neural network filter. So there's no sparsity there. It allows us to explore uh, the high dimensional mapping very uh, effectively. But then the benefits of using GNN when we have a sparse graph comes with W. And this is our result here. In a typical power network, the uh, number of lines are actually in the order of the number of uh, buses. So it's usually like two or three times the number of uh, nodes in the system. And because of that, the number of parameters in the GNN layer or the number of parameters non-zero parameters in W scales linearly with the number of nodes n. So in every layer of the graph neural net, we have a linear, um, or the number of parameters is in the linear region with the number of nodes. And this is a big decrease from a fully connected neural network with this n square. So, um, because we utilize the topology and specifically what we are doing here is to utilize the uh, locality property of LMP, we are able to make the uh, GNN very suitable for the um, prediction in real-time OPF. And uh, we, uh, as a result, we also attend this uh, complexity reduction uh, from N squared to N. 
So we can use that for predicting the prices of LMP. So basically, um, um, this uh, LMP prediction work has been considered in the past, uh, but then it's mostly based on statistical learning or SVM um, um, approach, but then not uh, using like a neural network uh, in the past. Uh, so the full like uh, uh, decision rules or the train of variables for the GN based LMP prediction is to say that, okay, if I have this input uh, uh, um, matrix uh, from every node, and then I train this uh, neural network uh, um, specified by parameter theta here, I can get the prediction of the LMP at every location, which is pi hat here. And using the LMP, because it's the uh, dual variable or multipliers, then I can determine the optimal primer uh, variables, which is the dispatch uh, real power solution. And accordingly, I can also form the line flow very well in the system. And then uh, in the basic version, we can consider just trying to match the LMP value uh, between um, the, uh, uh, the output value, the actual value, and then the predictive value, trying to minimize the error of the two. If we want to introduce some kind of regularization, we can also use this line flow because we can um, completely determine the line flow if I know the predicted pi value. So I can also introduce this uh, uh, regularization term to reduce the line flow violations. And this will be shown to uh, um, lead to better performance later on. So this is the uh, basic idea of our recent uh, conference paper uh, in uh, linked here. So in addition to that, we have uh, considered several extensions. Um, one thing is to do congested line uh, classification. And the idea is very similar because the congest line congestion pattern also has this topology dependency. So it enables us to also use GNN to classify whether a line is congested or not. And um, for classification type of task, we have used like uh, cross entropy type type of loss. And um, uh, also, uh, after a few layers of GNN, we also have a final fully connected layer just to try to predict this uh, zero one value for this binary classification task. So here are some results. Uh, so we have tested it on like a small system, 118 node, and also a bigger one, 2382 node system. Uh, for the small one, we consider the nonlinear AC OPF, and also the big one is the, the simplified linear DC OPF. So the type of matrix that we're considering here, uh, basically the LMP uh, prediction arrow. So the top uh, figure here is the LMP prediction arrow, the normalized L2 arrow. And we also compare the effects when we try to uh, introduce uh, this land flow limit because one, uh, the, one very important operating constraint in the OPF problem is the land flow limit satisfaction. So we want to see that whether um, this accurate uh, predicted LMP value can also uh, try to avoid any uh, possible land flow limit violation. Um, so we consider three solutions to propose GNN for LMP prediction or a genetic uh, fully connected neural network and another simplified uh, um, uh, fully connected neural network, but it still has the same complexity order as FCNN. It's called graph informed uh, DNN, but then it, it, its complexity order is still the same as a regular um, FCNN. So, uh, we consider uh, the original version, also the regularized version, when we regularize, uh, regularize the LMP prediction arrow with the line flow limits. So here are the results here on the top for the um, uh, LMP prediction. And the red one here is the proposed GNN, and then the green one is the fully connected, and the blue one is also uh, a similar fully connected uh, neural network. And we can see that in terms of LMP prediction performance is the post GNN is very close to um, the FCNN or the other uh, variation of FCNN. 
Um, if we use the uh, uh, feasibility regularization, and this is uh, the circle uh, one here, uh, the arrow actually uh, could uh, uh, decrease very visibly from um, the only using the LMP um, uh, loss function. So uh, definitely having the feasibility regularization is very helpful. Uh, so the uh, the bottom one here is with the um, um, with the um, um, uh, the land flow limit violation. Um, so for the small case, we didn't see much difference in the uh, the land flow limit violation. It's uh, at a very small level of one percent of violation, but for the bigger case. Uh, we do see a very uh, significant difference in the land flow limit violation. Actually, using the feasibility regularization, we are able to reduce the land flow limit violation to a very small uh, value. Um, in addition, uh, it seems that uh, the uh, regular, the fully connected neural network has some kind of uh, over uh, fitting issue because of the high number of parameters. And then uh, we, we do see that the land flow uh, uh, violation is much higher, uh, uh, much higher between the fully connected neural network and also uh, and the, the proposed GNN. So uh, as we mentioned, one of the futures of uh, GNN is in terms of uh, um, uh, reducing the number of parameters, and this is also verified by comparing the number of parameters existed uh, in each model. You can see a huge difference in terms of, uh, um, it's like order of magnitude different between fully connected, GN, uh, uh, fully connected neural network and then the proposed uh, GNN model. And, um, and that's why we can uh, better fit um, the training data without, um, with uh, less effects of uh, over parameterization. Uh, we have uh, applied that to predicting contrasting lines and uh, it's also for the small AC, uh, small system AC power flow and also the bigger system of DC power flow. So we use the recall, uh, which is essentially the true positive rate and also the F1 function, which is the balance between uh, true positive rate and false positive rate to try to uh, uh, see evaluate the performance between these three uh, neural network models, and uh, by and large, GNN uh, outperforms the other one, the other two, uh, thanks to its reduced complexity. As you can see here, that uh, it has the highest uh, recall and F1 score here. And uh, interestingly, uh, this um, uh, we again observe that the effects of over parameterization that uh, for the fully connected neural network, um, the uh, or the variation of fully connected neural network in the larger system, uh, its uh, performance is much worse than uh, the simple uh, uh, reduced complexity GNN model. So definitely having less number of parameters to fit uh, can uh, help with the GNN and uh, can help with the neural network over parameterization problem. So I would just quickly uh, 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 go over this slide because um, I think there are some questions, but uh, uh, after here, I will stop for question uh, for the question. So here is another uh, attractive future of GNN. Um, so we know that in real time operation, there could be some a lot of variations of uh, the land status, sometimes due to weather events or some kind of uh, unexpected fault events, the line can go out of service. And this is what we typically call a line outage. So when the topology changes, a regular uh, black box neural network model needs to be retrained whenever there's some topology variation. But because the GNN architecture already incorporates the topology, it can quickly adapt or what we call like transfer learning paradigm. It can quickly transfer to the new topology, even if there's some uh, differences in um, the system connectivity. So uh, we have tested the idea. We, we use this uh, originally nominal topology GNN, and then we apply it to some 
a trench topology by selecting randomly like a few lines to uh, disconnect them. And we want to see how this original nominal G uh, GNN work with this new topology. Uh, very interestingly, like uh, the fitting arrow is still very uh, uh, close to uh, the original nominal level uh, with a few exceptions that this uh, uh, for certain uh, line combination, it may have changed the uh, system uh, uh, mark, uh, the LMP pattern significantly. So there is a large error. But then for most of the uh, uh, contingency or topology change cases, uh, this error are uh, very similar. And if we go use the nominal GN to retrain it and for this new topology, it turns out that it's very fast. It only needs like three to five IPOC, and then all of these new topology cases can quickly converge to a small arrow. So the GNN model is very easy to adapt it to a new uh, topology connectivity condition or uh, adapt it to a new operating condition. So this is very interesting to us, and we are currently trying to understand better why this is the case. And we suspect this is because even though when there is some small topology perturbation, it does not change this subspace of the underlying graph model very significantly. And that's why we can adapt the original pre-trained GM model for the nominal case to this new topology very quickly. So with that, uh, I think uh, uh, this is the, uh, for the first part of the talk. If there are some questions, I can uh, uh, answer now. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. I just had a question about the, the axis. You had like a, I believe it was like a, an error. Yes, yeah, the normalized L2 error. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just trying to understand what that means in terms of like percentage deviation from the actual values. Yeah, so so we are comparing the error of predicting um, the pi, the LMP value, and then uh, just normalize it by uh, the vector, the the actual vectors norm. Um, so it's like a ten percent, um, like here is like in like ten percent of arrow, effectively. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Hi, I've got a question. I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, so um, just a quick clarification. So for this um, locational marginal price, so we're predicting it so that we can optimize the power flow. Is that how this model is working? Okay. Yes. And when we are optimizing the power flow, what are we optimizing for? Is it distance travel, losses? Yeah, great question. So uh, in for conventional generations, is this cost. So it's like the depending on the type of fuel that we're using to supply uh, this uh, to to power this generator, basically. So um, but then uh, if there's some kind of demand flexibility, so this is one thing I, I didn't talk very specifically. If there are like a demand response resources, it can also be incorporated into a cost here. So it's like, oh, what is the cost if I want to curtail this load slightly? So it's essentially uh, like economic cost. Okay, and does this cost um, account for, let's say we have transmission over greater distance, we have greater losses, does it account for that, that cost? In the ACOPF, that's a great question. So in the ACOPF, the losses are embedded into the power flow equation or the constraint here. So yes, it will account for uh, the potential losses on the lines. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Are our current our current power companies using GNNs for L L L L LMP prediction? Great question. No, they don't. So so far, uh, the the focus is still on developing like superior um, optimization solver to solve it. So it's just based on the instance to solve it. Yeah. And then, so how does GNN compare to? You talked about SVMs and other ML techniques. How does GNN compare it to other techniques? And I assume that it must be difficult to get training data that is appropriate in the GNN format, or the pre-processing must have taken a long time. 
Um, actually, it's not too much different if we want to apply like either uh, GNN or SF, SVM, but then uh, definitely we have observed that the SVM like uh, has the known issue that if we want to go to a nonlinear prediction task and then we have to run into the problem of choosing like kernels and these kind of issues. So it's not always very easy to tune up like SVM for the LMP prediction. But uh, in terms of pre-processing, um, so we actually used the, the actual Pi or the LMP was produced by the optimization software in the offline setting. So, so, um, it, so yeah, we, we don't need to like take additional effort because it will already, it will automatically give us like the LMP at every location. Okay, yeah, and then, if I uh, fully uh, addressed your question at all. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I guess my question is to follow up, given that GNNs are some sort of a black box, have, have the power companies that you've worked with expected you guys to provide some sort of interpretability to these models? And if so, what are the next steps in figuring what what is actually going on under the hood? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I think uh, definitely like, these kind of analysis when we go to like uh, adaptive uh, the topology adaptivity like this is something that we would need for uh, uh, practical implementation so um, I guess the uh, link here is that this W matrix or this the uh, graph filter W here is based on the topology so in some way it explained to us that if there is a high demand in one location how it could affect what's the like the biggest impact to other locations LMP so there are some kind of connection um, that we know like usually um, when there are uh, like a high power demand in one location it could cause congestion and uh, accordingly it will uh, increase the uh, the cost of supplying electricity in certain locations so there are some connection because of this topology uh, based graph filter but yeah we haven't uh, like fully um, try to uh, establish that yet. Yeah, that's a great point, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm uh, <laughs> um, uh, having um, a second part. So, um, so we have, the second part is most on the distribution grid side. So essentially, uh, we want to use the same idea to do um, uh, coordination or co-optimization of the grid edge resources. So this is like a distribution system or what we call grid edge, where you have controllable devices like PV uh, photovoltaic, um, uh, inverters that can supply what we call reactive power to the grid to improve the operation. So this is a type, similar type of OPF problem, but then a key challenge here is that we don't have a very frequent uh, communication. So um, at every node itself, it can quickly measure its own local quantity, but there is no like a very frequent uh, communication between a centralized location with this uh, distributed PV. And this is the major operating um, uh, challenge in distribution system. So people have thought about using uh, similar ideas of learning for uh, optimization because this is also a special instance of OPF problem. And there are uh, several papers uh, around this area. So one big issue in this problem specifically is that um, the operating objective is related to the voltage as we will see soon. And a lot of problems have not considered that what if the resultant solution will violate that voltage limit. So uh, our focus is trying to address this statistic risk related to this voltage limit violation. How can we incorporate certain type of uh, uh, objective law uh, into the loss function uh, to better improve the worst case uh, voltage violation performance? 
So just to quickly go over on the problem itself. So uh, yeah, so you can see that there are high similarities between this problem of the uh, real-time market problem, although it is only in a very small geographic area, like a neighborhood uh, power grid. And uh, because we are looking into maintaining the voltage everywhere in the system, so more of the interest here is to uh, change the Q, the reactive power provided by this distributed PV, such that the voltage is within the limits, uh, upper lower limits. And then the objective here is related, can be cast as the losses in the system, as, uh, as mentioned earlier. So we can use some kind of linearization tools to deal with the, uh, the model here. And then uh, if we linearize the power flow model, then it's actually a, a very nice convex quadratic program with linear constraints. So the uh, more challenge here is that to solve this problem in a centralized fashion, then I have to collect information everywhere from this distributed PV in a very fast fashion, because this PV uh, output can change in seconds uh, time scale. Uh, but currently, the kind of communication that we have between the end users or the uh, remote PV and then the con central controller um, can only afford like a 15 minutes, one, one, one time every 15 minutes. So it's impossible to solve this problem in a centralized fashion. So people have thought about of using this similar uh, neural network idea. So say that uh, the control center try to train uh, this or collect the, um, the operating condition for multiple instances and solve for the optimal solution at every, uh, uh, every PV individually. And then instead of training a total neural network for the whole uh, system, we train a scalable one that at every node N, we are only trying to use the local uh, data. So the local measurement data can be available in a very fast time scale. So we only use the local data trying to predict the local solution. So of course, there is some suboptimality sub issue because we are uh, not allowing for full feedback. And this is a known issue in distributed control that uh, there are concerns of uh, like optimality per se. Um, but then uh, we can still do it by using like the nonlinear uh, trans transfer capability of uh, neural networks. And similarly, GN architecture can be applied as well. So we just use the same uh, filter uh, everywhere in the node. So um, as mentioned earlier, the, the last function that we would use nominally is only taking every sample K here in an equal fashion, like a mean square arrow. So it's averaged over all the sample K. So um, the issue here is that there, even though if we look at this is the distribution of the sample losses is typically in this kind of shape with most of the samples concentrated in a smaller uh, re uh, regime. But then there are could be like the end tail can be really long and these are like the worst case samples. So if we only take the average across the samples, we're trying to minimize at this level, it does not help us to mitigate these worst case losses. So very famous uh, metric in uh, risk, uh, risk metro is called conditional value at risk or CWA in robust optimization, which is to say that we consider the losses caused by these worst case samples. So uh, given a significance level alpha, we average uh, the losses uh, across the top alpha number of samples. So, um, so our idea here is that in addition to fit this MSE arrow, we can also try to incorporate the CWA risk measure with the regularization parameter. And this can help us to also reduce the worst case performance. So we can consider the worst case performance of predicting um, the, uh, uh, the Q solution. We can also consider the CWA for uh, the worst case voltage limit uh, violation. Um, so one thing that we have 
done um, is to address the computation issue. So typically C wireless is very popularly used because it can preserve con convexity of the model. But we know that neural networks are, is typically non-convex. Although there are some recent results trying to generalize CWAS, uh, a property to this uh, general non-convex function called, uh, that satisfies PL condition. But then um, we might not be worried about the convexity per se, but then the key challenge is in the computation side. This is because that when we try to um, uh, compute um, or train uh, the CWA regularized objective, one issue we have is that um, it only depends on the worst case samples. So say like top 10%. If originally I have a thousand samples, I can only have a hundred to compute the CWA loss. And in particular, when we use more more than machine learning tools like uh, a stochastic gradient or mini batch methods, it can further reduce the number of samples that we can use to compute this gradient. So there is a high uh, concern about the statistical fidelity issue when we try to compute a gradient of CWA when we do gradient descent. So we have a, a small idea here to just address it uh, from a numeric standpoint. And this is through like a selection step. So basically, we when we use like a mini batch type of method for learning a C1 regularized objective. Um, in a typical mini batch, we randomly generate a, a subset of samples in this mini batch BI. Um, and in a typical uh, gradient descent, we would just use the gradient based on this mini batch BI. Um, so to uh, to tackle the issue with the statistical significance related to the CWA uh, objective, we don't use every uh, mini batch here. We only select the mini batch when if it has these worst case samples. And what is the criterion for that? We set a threshold gamma alpha, uh, gamma alpha here. And if the CWA value for this mini batch is higher than the threshold, we will use it to compute the gradient and do one step of gradient descent. If the CWA value for this mini batch is very small, it means that it doesn't contain a lot of worst case samples. So we will disregard this mini batch. And this is a um, very uh, simple, a simple step to implement, but it turns out to be useful to save on the computation time uh, when we try to uh, computing, um, try to compute the uh, 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 gradient for the CWA objective. So here are some results for the six nodes, uh, um, uh, six DR nodes or six PV nodes in a, a 123 node system. And the, the decision here is to determine on this reactive power Q. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we you use this scalable uh, neural network. So each uh, individual neural network at uh, each e, uh, PV will only use the local information like power output and also the uh, incident land flow to determine what is the optimal uh, Q solution uh, locally. So we compare the effects of using the CWA in the um, regularization. So the red one is the uh, standard MSE objective, and the green one is uh, using the CWA and also using our proposed the mini batch selection idea. And then the blue one is the, just the CWA with the regular, does not do any mini batch se uh, selection, the regular gradient descent. So this is the arrow, the normalized arrow at uh, uh, every node here. And uh, we can see that um, when we incorporate the CWA risk related to predicting the Q solution here, it does not change much on this uh, prediction performance. And the reason here is that the prediction is already pretty good for the Q value. So uh, 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 at every node, we can predict the Q value very accurately. So it does not uh, make too much difference if we want to mitigate the worst case prediction performance. However, uh, we do see that using the CWA value or the CWA regularization, 
it cause it accelerates the computation um, in some sense. So when we use the CYR regularization, also introduce this mini batch selection uh, algorithm, uh, it can reduce the computation time uh, by like uh, 20, 30 percent. And especially that uh, uh, this mini batch has also reduced the uh, time for each uh, per IPOC computation when we have the CYR cost. So you may wonder, like, why? What's the point? To have this CWAR? So the risk is not on predicting the Q solution. As I said, the Q is accurately predicted, so it does not change the Q uh, prediction error very much. However, if we consider the CWAR for the voltage violation, so remember these Q decisions are supposed to maintain the system voltage to be close to uh, 1.0 per unit or the rated voltage level. So therefore, if we plot out the distribution of the voltage deviation, the normalized voltage deviation from the nominal 1.0, you can see that if I use the original MSE or even the optimal one from the optimal solution, the tail can go over 0.05. And this is the uh, threshold that we can uh, allow for a typical operation. So this, without considering the risk, of this uh, worst case uh, samples in terms of the voltage performance, we can tend to have very large or the worst case voltage violation would be higher. But if we introduce the regularization for the risk of voltage deviation, it can effectively reduce the worst case um, voltage deviation here to be and make it to be lower than 0.05. So um, if we have some issues with the worst case performance, it's very effective to use the CWA uh, risk measure here. And we can see the similar level of uh, computational improvement here in the right table. Actually, the improvement is even more compared to before that we have seen um, like almost 40% of reduction of computation time. Yeah, so with that, I I think um, um, uh, we have uh, uh, seen how the uh, CVR risk can help us address the uh, worst case voltage uh, deviation performance. Um, so we have uh, applied the same ideas to another task, which may be more relevant um, to both of uh, California and Texas residents, as we have seen more and more extreme weather events, uh, or what we call like emergency uh, operating conditions. So when there are like natural disasters related to winter storm or unprecedented level of low temperature or wildfires, it can damage the uh, physical infrastructure, the grid infrastructure. So we have also used similar machine learning ideas to enable fast response. Um, to uh, utilize these emergency response resources like dispatchable load or change the topology of the grid. Um, and this scalable neural network uh, model can help us to attend this solution in a, uh, uh, in a uh, quick and also safe manner. So this is an idea that we have used neural network or machine learning to try to determine what is the optimal uh, uh, load shedding decision from the control without the intervention of a control center. So moving from centralized to decentralized uh, low shedding paradigm. Um, I don't think I uh, have uh, um, uh, the, uh, the time to talk about it, but essentially it's the same idea that we want to enable each individual node without knowing what's happening in a global scale, but then just use its local measurement data and then use a pre-trained um, optimal decision rule to figure out what is the best corrective action in terms of uh, load reduction. So this is the ongoing work. Um, yeah, we um, probably can come back and talk about it in a, uh, in a different time. Okay, so uh, in summary, um, we have seen um, 
two plus a, a short, <laughs> small one uh, applications of how to use uh, uh, machine learning on neural network um, in uh, operating power grid. We specifically looking at how to incorporate physics knowledge about the grid, for example, the topology information here to simplify the model, re reduce the number of parameters in the neural network model and address the issue of over parameterization, for example. So we have seen how to introduce risk measure to address the potential voltage violation issue when we deploy this uh, decentralized uh, neural network uh, on the field. We want to make sure that the resultant solution does not cause a lot of voltage violation. Um, yeah, so we have uh, uh, these similar ideas um, um, using neural network to learn this fast response uh, actions for each individual resources. And uh, this is the ongoing work and we have a lot of uh, potential uh, extensions for all of them. So with that, I, I would like to conclude the talk and just want to <laughs> uh, re-emphasize that there are a lot of opportunities that we can use machine learning when the grid is uh, transitioning to a different operation paradigm, where we need to consider resilience so that the fast computation or the fast fit forward computation capability of neural net is very uh, convenient for that. When we have dynamic resources or some kind of uh, new type of resources that that we don't have the exact model of them, um, there could be new opportunities of using uh, more like a, a model-free uh, learning uh, for these problems. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. And uh, if there are some more questions, happy to take as well. Hi, good question. Yeah. So this is on the second solution, your distribute, uh, distributed energy resources. So just to clarify, you are trying to predict what is the optimal output of each distributed um, energy resource, right? So yes. I'm just wondering, do we actually have the, the policy and the technology to control kind of the output of this individual distributed energy resource? Because this is basically telling each house how much solar power they can in a sense, sell to the grid, right? Yeah, so so it's a, it's a ancillary service, reactive power. So uh, they may not directly sell the uh, the real power output from the PV, but then they do sell some kind of uh, power to the grid. Um, so currently, so, so that's a great point. So currently, without knowing this uh, global information, they would do a simple like PI or like a linear scaling rule. So they would just uh, react linearly to like the local uh, condition. So uh, the uh, neural network uh, based decision rules enable it to explore the nonlinear operating conditions and then construct this nonlinear decision rules to help to approach this globally optimal solution. So that's essentially why we want to uh, use a nonlinear decision rule here. Got it. And for this current solution whereby you say they use the linear PI, that is done by the distribution grid, right? That is by each individual resource locally, too. Okay, so and who's enforcing this? Is it like the, the distribution grid operator that's enforcing this? Or is it um, our transmission system operator? Yeah, so it's indirectly by the distribution uh, grid, or it's kind of like a uh, like a kind of pre-config uh, into the hardware. So they config that oh, each of these nodes they would react this uh, react to the local condition in this way. So yes, it is according to the standards, but um, but it's not like directly commanded by the distribution operator. It is only like um, using. It is pre-programmed, but then in the real-time operation or real-time control, it only takes the local uh, input to compute the corresponding uh, Q solution. Got it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And, and any more questions? Okay. Let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. All right.